It's my great pleasure today, Friday the 24th of June 1988, to welcome to Bracknell, Marshal of the Royal Air Force, Sir John Grandy. Sir John's career spanned that great period in the Royal Air Force's history between the pre-war build-up um, and uh, the time that the Royal Air Force gave up the great deterrent to the Royal Navy. Sir John had the unusual distinction of having been a Commander-in-Chief in three successive appointments, firstly in Germany, then at Bomber Command, and finally in the Far East. He became Chief of the Air Staff in April 1967. It was an illustrious career, and so, Sir John, we're delighted that you've spared the time to come here to Bracknell this morning. Thank you very much. And I wonder, sir, if I might start, uh, I suppose, at the beginning. Uh, you joined the Royal Air Force in 1931, at a time, in fact, uh, rather before the pre-war build-up, when defence spending was low, uh, and only a few years before that very famous King and Country debate at the Oxford Union. And I just wondered what it was that prompted you to take up the military life. Well, I think that's a fairly easy question to answer. As to what my motivation was, I was born in 1913 at Northwood, not far from where the headquarters are, the Naval Air Force headquarters mm. are now, when that was entirely green country and very few houses. And then after the war, uh, Northolt was going as, a, as an Air Force, Royal Air Force station. And I remember the early days when I used to cycle over to North Holt and hang over the fence and watch the flying and became absolutely imbued with it all. And I couldn't really believe, you know, you look up there and think there's a chap in there driving that thing around. And I got frightfully excited about it and was determined that that was the life for me. Uh, now, you just mentioned, you said there wasn't much money spent in those days on defence. Well, that's quite true. And my father had planned a career in oil for me. He thought oil was, and he was dead right, oil was the coming thing. Mm. But I was so keen, uh, I managed to persuade him that, uh, you know, I really must get this flying bug out right. of my system. Against a certain amount of parental opposition. Oh, yes. He was dead against it. What's the good of doing that? He yes. said, there's not going to be a war, which he, nobody thought there was in 1931. Right. He said, you'll have, he said, I'm not going to send you to Cranmore. If you go in the Air Force, you'll you're on your own. And you'll do five years. And what is, you'll have five years wasted. All you'll be able to do is to fly an airplane. That's what will get you anywhere. So... However, he uh, relented, and that was, that's how it came about. So you didn't actually go to Cranwell, you, you came in yeah, I think, I got a, as a, as a got short service commission. Right. And went, uh, I learned to fly at Sealand. Yes. Five FTS. Wonderful. And then you went on, I think, as your first appointment was to, uh, to 54 Squadron. To 54 at Bulldogs. 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 That's right. Was it actually your wish to, to become a fighter pilot, or was that, in a sense, thrust Oh, I think you? so. I yes. think... Um, Oh, that's a good word. I was going to use the word snobism. That would be offensive for one's bomber friends. <laughs> in those days at Sealand, you could either you get onto Atlases or Siskins, and the aim was to get onto the Siskin if you possibly could, and that was the yes. thing. And one's thoughts were, I remember, very uh, much reinforced were one day when we saw our first Fury, Fury, Hawker Fury, came up and landed at Sealand. Yes. So, you know, that's the thing. We must get onto fighters. That was the idea. Well, I must say, in a sense, I don't think that uh, sort of attitude has changed all that much over <laughs> the years. Yeah. But never mind. Um, <clears throat> but you were saying in, in '31, of course, people didn't believe uh, that a war would come. But, but I think by the time '36, '37 came, that had changed. And I just wondered how people at the at the front line, or at least you yourself, of course, were pretty near the front line, training the front line. I think at the time, how you and your colleagues felt the Royal Air Force would actually fare in that impending conflict? Or did you not think about it very much at all? Well, you just remember that um, well, in, you said 36, 37, 36, I was 23, mm -hmm. uh, and I was thinking about getting married. I got married when I was 24, so I had a lot of those sort of rather happy, lovely thoughts in one's mind. Also, I, I don't think then I mean, one flew like hell in training and everything, and I... I suppose we did think about the war, but I don't think whenever one might have thought, well, this war isn't going to happen. And on the other hand, you had to sort of weigh it all up. I don't think one consciously thought, my goodness, I wonder if we're going to win. I, one thought if it did happen, yes, of course we'll win. You know, I, you, I don't think it dominated one's mind, that, mm. that thought, those thoughts at the time, really. Mm. So it was more an intuitive feel and... Yes, I mean... Self-confidence. Yes, one, was, one enjoyed the service, one was proud of it, one thought it was good. 
that's about as far as one thought. Age 23, I think. Yes. Now, I suppose we all of us, we, we know the sort of equipments and so on we had in those days uh, and what their capabilities were, but what about the, what about the training of, of, of our air crew? How did you feel about that in those days? Was it... Was it professionally done? Yes. Oh, I think it was. I, I really do. I, I think we... I mean, those of us who've been to CFS and become flying instructors, the standards are very high. Standards of instruction were high. Mm. And I was lucky enough to spend a certain amount of time with a London University Air Squadron. I think the University Air Squadron was a very good scheme. All those chaps went in and did well. Those that mm. uh, survived. And, and I think the standard of training of the Air Force always has been good, and it was certainly very good in those days. Mm. Most, I think it was a very important factor. Mm. Did, did you actually, um, I mean, did the fighter boys actually have many exercises against people in Bomber Command, for example? Did that, yes. did that happen? Yes, one did. Oh, yes, I forgot what we call them, the LDAs or something. Yes, they are co-op exercises. Really? So it wasn't just one v one in the same squadron or anything like no, that? No, you, you did exercise and we did all sorts of rather old-fashioned maneuvers like fighter command attack one go, you know, all that kind of thing, which yes. was proved in the war to be completely futile. But right. we did do that sort of thing, yeah. yes. Yes, I see. Um, and what about the attitudes of the air crew? Was it, uh, was it all a bit gung-ho or were people, or was it more, much more professional than that? I would say it was far less gung-ho than today's press and media try to make it out to be. Really? So if you have, this is the media, I think it was, the gung-ho was a bit down there and the professionalism wasn't way up there. I think it was a, uh, just sort of average confidence. Really. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it was really terrifically gung-ho. In fact, during the Battle of Britain, one was a point not often made, in the evening, I was quite tired, you know, and oh, so nice. although you did roar off from, from time to time when you had time off, but on the, on the whole, it was quite hard work, was it? Yes. Now, of course, you went, you, you spent a lot of your time in training, didn't you? You mentioned mm. London UAS, and I think you were at what, 9 FTS and 13 FTS, but then you went on to the Central Gunnery School, I think, for a short time. Yes. What was that like? Well, I'll tell you a bit about that. I, I, I was beginning to worry at... Uh, at 9 FTS that, um, I think it was 13 FTS I was at, at, at uh, DREM, mm. when the war started. Mm. And uh, I was rather worried then that I wouldn't get into a fighter squadron. So mm. I badgered a friend of mine called Johnny Peel, who was in postings in the Air Ministry that then was, and said, come on, you've got to get me out of this. And uh, he was very kind, eventually said, well, I can get you away from there, but you've got to go to a place called Central Gunnery School. So I went down there to Warmwall, where we used to drive Wellingtons and Hamdens and Whitleys around mm -hmm. with people learning how to be gunners in the back as a sort of stopgap till the squadron came and became was available. It? So it improved, it broadened, widened my flying experience, but not much else. But it, but it was very much just the next stage. Yes, picture. very much so. And, and then you went to 249, I think. Then I went to 249. I had to reform 249, or reform it. It was disbanded in 1918. Mm -hmm. And we started as a Spitfire squadron and then changed to Hurricanes. And were given a very short time to become operational. That was an interesting shift. Well, why was that? I mean, most well, squadrons went from Hurricanes to Spitfires. I think. Yeah, that's right. I think, well, we started on Spitfires, and I think Spitfire losses then were beginning to get rather high. So our new Spits went down as replacements for the squadrons in the south, and we got Hurricanes. Possibly, I don't really know, probably production problems might have had something to do with it at that mm. time. Although we were slightly sad, there wasn't time to be disappointed, and the, and the Hurricanes we got were ones with uh, Rotol, uh, variable pitch propellers, which are three-bladed propellers, which are very fine performers compared to the original yes. fixes. So uh, we took it in our stride. Yes. Now, of course, Sir Winston Churchill had some very fine words to say about our Battle of Britain pilots, and we all know that, but did you and your colleagues actually think of yourselves in that light, or...? Honestly, I don't think no, we did. I mean, there's that old crack which you must have heard many times as a chap who when he heard Winston say in the mess, never so much owned by so many so of you, he said, he must be thinking of our mess bills. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wonderful. That was really quite well. No, you didn't think about that at that time. Right. No, no, not at all. It was just good for the, uh, for the general population. Oh, yes. Yeah, boost morale yeah. and... Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes, which I'm sure it must have done. Yes, very yes. much. Yeah. Now, of course, we, we won the Battle of Britain, I suppose, not only through the, the skill and bravery of our 
pilots and indeed the hard work of the ground crews, but also because we had a pretty good infrastructure. I mean, essentially the, the radar infrastructure, the command and control system that went with it and so on. And there, I suppose, we were, well, alone in the world in a sense, weren't we? I mean, the Germans had nothing like it, the French had nothing like it, the Dutch, the Belgians, not, neither. Was it actually appreciated at the time, particularly by those in fighter command, that that we actually had an edge with this yes, high tech I, kit? Yes, I, I, I think time. that is. Uh, mind you, the Germans had radar too, because they were not they were not on a defensive; they were on the offensive. Quite. Yes. So, uh, I think it was appreciated. I've just been reading a book which is. Uh, recently published called Gun Button to Fire by a boy called Ginger Neal who was in 249 Squadron. Was he had no idea he was written a book. I hadn't seen him for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And he brings out the point in that book very clearly how the, we started in 10 Group and we moved, moved on from Church Fenton to Warm to uh, Boscombe Down. Mm -hmm. And the controlling in the 10 Group area wasn't very good really because they didn't have anything like the radar coverage over the South Southampton and to the west, right. as there was con concentrated around the London area. And then when we moved up to North Weald, controlling was mar far better, mm -hmm. and it did give us a gigantic edge, that's quite right. Yes. You said just now that uh, this enabled us to win the Battle of Britain, bravery everyone in here, so okay, but I think really that one of the major reasons of success in the Battle of Britain, because the Germans made tactical errors. Yes. Red. I don't think we must never forget that. Yes. Uh, yes, I mean, converting or diverting their bombs. Diverting their bombing offensive. Airfields. If they'd gone on and on on our airfields, if they just stuck to them and resisted the temptation of the juicy target of what they thought was the juicy target of London, if they'd gone on plastering airfields and plastering aircraft factories, we'd have run put out of business. Yes. Uh, I, that's my view. Anyway. Yes. Even with the factories churning out, what, hundreds of billions. Yes, but if they're really good attacks, they could have, uh, instead yes. of attacking the docks, which didn't really matter very much at the time. So yeah, well, I, I think that is a major failure. It's been brought out in a lot of books, hasn't sure. it? Yes, it has, yes. Mm. Um, but yes, I suppose we were very lucky, weren't we? Yeah. But you also had, I think, some time at, at Fighter Command, didn't mm. you? In uh, the tail end of 40 and early 41. Yes. In the ops room. I imagine there you must have seen considerable changes in, in our tactics and in our... Oh, very much so, yes. I was shot down in, 1940, in September 40, and I... And I I had damaged my leg, so I couldn't get back into a car. So I went to the option, as you said, at Fighter, and uh, certainly there one saw great advances happening almost all the time. Really? Things like the Y service and those things coming in, yes. which were absolutely fascinating. Yes. Uh, and uh, the night, well, there was great worry then because the Germans were switching to night attacks. There was great worry about how, how the AI radars and all that sort of stuff was going to work. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was intriguing to see all that. Mm. Was there, was there in fact a great push from Fighter Command to get the scientists to develop better technique? Oh, I think so, very much. I think people like uh, Sir Henry Tizard, mm -hmm. the prof, you know, Winston's uh, scientific advisor, uh, and uh, pressure from Dowding. Yes, a big scientific effort. Did the scientists actually come down to? Yes, often one used to see these strange looking yeah. people. Really? Out. Yes. So the, the, the connections, the, the liaison was quite good. Yeah, I think so. Very much so. Yes. And, and what, about, um, what about the personalities of the time? I mean, who were you dealing with then? Shorty Douglas and uh, Lee Later Lee. on, yes. You couldn't have two more different characters than Lord Diding and Sholto. I mean, Stuffy was a. Everybody knows Stuffy, all the by has been written up. He was a taciturn, quiet, uh, obviously very determined, dedicated man. Mm. Sholto, far more extrovert. Uh, funny enough, in a way, shy with people, but a bit of extrovert, a bullion sort of person, quite different mm. uh, in every way. Mm. But still a great leader of men. Yes, in his Probably way. Because of yeah, him. he was. He, he was a. He, he imposed his personality and uh, did lead in an entirely different way to Stuffy, or, or to Bert. I mean, there are three very different people, Bert Harris, Dowding, Sholto. Yes. Yeah, I was always intrigued when, uh, I forget, that uh, Bomber Harris never very never went out to his stations very much. He, he never did. It was all he... done from the headquarters through his staff right. offices. Uh, was, was that the case in Fighter mind, Command but... too? He, he never did, I think, as mm. I understand it. Whereas Dowding... Uh, 
did frequently. Did right. he remember Stuffy coming to North Wheel really? two or three times? And he would come and talk to the yes, the he'd come and walk about and talk. Really? And uh, uh, Keith Park did as well. Yes, uh, very much. It's curious that there yeah, should have been is. this this mm. uh, difference in approach yeah. isn't there, between the, so. the commands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you went on, I think, to Coatishaw after that, didn't you? Presumably, yes. when you, you know, when uh, when the leg had mended, um, and I think you were AC flying there, but doing rather different job. Yes, that was a, a different job altogether. There were Spitfires there, and our main work well, it was a there was a wing there of uh, whirlwinds, twin engine whirlwinds. They were whirlwinds, weren't they? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, made by Westlands. There's a, a squadron of them, if I remember rightly, one or two Spitfire squadrons and a night fighter squadron. Mm. And the main job of the Spits was shipping recce, going across the North Sea, looking for shipping, uh, enemy shipping going up and down the Dutch coast. Right. That was our main work there, really, right. which is quite interesting. And was that armed recce, or was it simply a question of finding, seeing what was there, reporting? Primarily on? finding and coming back. Was it? Reporting what you'd seen, and then the... Coast people would go out and attack. That was the main. That was the main I think. rationale. And you presumably flew on, flew as well. Oh yes, an administrative. Uh, yes, no, I'm mostly flying. The administration was wasn't really my concern. One flew on a lot of those wreckies, and we did air defence as well, mm -hmm. normal air defence of that sector. Mm -hmm. And then I think you went on to command RAF Doxford, didn't you? A rather change in role, a change in yes. aircraft too, because that was the I think the first. Mm -hmm. uh, typhoon wing that was formed. Yes, right? sir, I would, it's an amusing story there because on the day of the February the 12th, 1942, it was ingrained in my memory because yeah. the, that was the day the Nice Now and Scharnhaus went through the channel. Remember yes, that? It was, and, uh, the channel dash. We, that's right. And we knew there was some big, something big on that day. It would, you could sort of get the feeling coming down the line, but nobody knew what it was. And almost towards the end of the day, we were scrambled and told what was happening and sold to push off all the Spitfires in a southeasterly heading mm -hmm. and uh, look out for any enemy aircraft and or any fighters attacking our bombers and uh, protect the bombers and come back again. Yes. Well, we flew to our maximum range in pretty murky weather and we didn't see a thing mm -hmm. except one or two returning bombers and came home again. Yes, my, my understanding was always that the command and control of that was, was a little bit weak. Oh, yes. Nobody knew quite when a, the swordfish were going to be over target. That's right. It was a, it was a very mix-up day mm. altogether. And we were all got back short of fuel and nearly dark and fed up. Mm. And in the mess that evening, the I had a message. The AOC, uh, Vice Marshal Saul, wanted to speak to me. Well, that's very unusual for the AOC to speak to the wing commander. Mm. So I thought, oh, this is terrible. And he said, some, I don't really remember how the conversation went, but he said something like, well, no trade today, or something like that. And I said, no, sir. And then he said, well, uh, I want you to leave Coltishaw. And I thought, oh, that's the sack. I said, yes, where for? And he said, Duxford. He said, you'll just go there tomorrow. <laughs> so I thought, well, well so I again, I said, what for? And he said, to command the place, that's why. So I was, you know, off like a flash. So great. To Duxford. So that was really rather exciting. And that yes. was the start of the typhoon wing. We started yes. to build up the typhoons at Duxford then. Yes. Because in a sense, that was, I mean, I, I would have thought, in a sense, our first multi rail combat aircraft. Yes, we phrase. didn't. Nobody invented that phrase. No, then. quite. <laughs> and it was it was intended as an interceptor. Mm. But you but used it for all sorts of things, didn't you? Yes, I mean we had lots of. That's right. We had a lot of troubles with the typhoon up there. We had a big deal of engine troubles. I won't bore you with the technicalities of that. But anyway, it was became quite clear that this was not an aeroplane to heave around. Uh, trying to mix it with 109s or 190s, uh, mm. it was far too heavy. It was very fast. But it was too heavy. The view out of the thing was very poor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it was from our experience, I think, at Duxford, that it was we concluded that the right role for the typhoon would be ground attack right. uh, or anti-shipping of a primarily ground attack. And of course, it did develop as a sort of tank buster and was yeah, it's quite a particular normal campaign. Oh, yeah. Very successful. So it was a good ship. Yeah, mm. very rugged aeroplane. Mm. But I mean, during that transition phase. Could the crews actually cope with all those roles, or was it never used quite like that? I mean, you. Yeah, well, I'd left the scene by then. I mean, the, by the I was only a year at Duxford, mm. and the, the wing was led by a chap called Gillam, Dennis Gillam. Very, very gallant pilot, and a very, very tough guy indeed. Very good. 
And he was very keen on this ground attack business, and I think mm -hmm. he had a great deal to do with converting people Did he? to, you know, mm -hmm. so I think a lot of that would, uh, credit there should go to, to him. Interesting, yeah, mm -hmm. right in the middle of the war. But you, you spent, I think, only half the war in Britain, didn't you? Um, and I think it was after, after Duxford that you went overseas, firstly to, to the Middle East. That's right. Uh, uh, and I think back again in, in, in air, air defense and yes, air training. As that's I right. Uh, Sholto, uh, Sholto Douglas went to the Middle East at the end of '42 as commander-in-chief, mm -hmm. and he took several people with him, uh, and one or two group captures, including me, and I was sent up to Tripoli mm -hmm. to run the air defense of Tripoli just after the fall of Tripoli, which was quite an exciting time. Mm -hmm. The very big attacks on that. It was the main port of entry for shipping, which it was very important to Montgomery at the time to get shipping and supplies in there before the Marath battle and the turn up to Tunis. Yes. So the Germans attacked it a great deal and we, we had just a sort of orth orthodox air defense. What, what sort of aircraft did you have out there? We had hurricanes, uh, but mostly bow fighters because it, most attacks were at night. Mm. And I was up there for about, oh, I think, about three months, no, no, about two or three months, I think. And it was successful, was it? Yes, uh, certainly. And we had terrific anti-aircraft barrage as well. We worked very closely there. And then after that, I went back to the canal zone to command another training unit, which, yes. uh, which was very nice, but began to fall after a bit. I bet it did. Was that actually a deliberate policy then, to try and interleave training appointments and operational appointments? I don't know. Or was uh, it just coincidence that that happened to you? Yes, I, I think so. I think they would get one or a bit of a rest or something mm. like that. Possibly that was something to do with it. Mm. But you don't know of any conscious policy to no, do No, not to, really. Uh, no. Oh, yeah. I see. But presumably out there, you, you had nothing like the sort of radar cover that uh, that we would have had in Britain. Up in Tripoli? Mm. No, no, not much. Well, so it was just visual... There, there was there was radar certainly, but not. I think there must have been mobile radars, you know, on lorries. I, I, we, right. Nothing like the the long range chair. No, no, no. no. Right. Interesting. And then, for some curious reason, and I'd be intrigued to hear quite why it was, you were, you went out to the Far East, I think, after that. Yes. Well, I on to on to Dakotas. That's right. So how did that come about? Well. I, as I told you, I went back to Pond and OTU mm. uh, in the Canal Zone, which is, which is uh, I mentioned was very enjoyable. It's a gentleman's life, really, compared to the war. But this began to pour. One's conscience pricked a bit. So come on, I must get back After to the this first war. week or two. <laughs> yes, I must get back to the war before it's over. And uh, I, there's a chapel, Whitney Strait, uh, in the Middle East at that time, uh, doing as uh, responsible for two six, not two sixteen group. Yes, I think it was. Can't quite remember the name, the number of the group, mm. and he was doing air supply from Italy into Yugoslavia and all that sort of thing, which seemed to me rather exciting work. Yes. So I talked with him a lot and was managed to persuade uh, Shelto had gone then, and I think Sir Keith Park was the CNC then. And I managed to persuade him that I wanted to get back to the war, and he said, "Well, the right thing for you to do is to convert onto Dakotas, which is takes no time at all." I mean, and then we'll see what can be done. But then, at that time, I think great efforts were being turned towards the Far East, mm -hmm. and air supply was becoming a big thing in the Far East, and so chaps like me who were just flying around in Dakotas all got moved out there. That's how mm -hmm. that came about. But it was very much your own initiative then that you got onto mm -hmm. the right. conversion course. And yes, I had no idea of going to Burma. I, I wanted mm -hmm. to get back into Europe. Mm -hmm. And I thought air supply into Yugoslavia might be rather exciting, yes. but uh, it turned out to be air supply in Burma. And was that exciting too? Very, yes. Yes, I'll bet it was. Yes, much worse weather. Yes, I'm sure. And uh, rather difficult if you had to ditch anywhere. Yes. I think our biggest, tri di di greatest difficulty there was the weather and the fact that we had awful maps I mean, in the terrain. One didn't really know the proper heights of mountains. Anyway, mm. a long time ago, but it was good fun. Mm. Did you know any of the... Uh, of our leaders out there in the Far East. Did you get to meet people like Slim and I suppose eventually yes. Van Batten? Uh, yes, Slim, uh, Lord Van Batten came to see us. Those are the two. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, Paddy Bandon was there. Yes, I got quite. to know him tremendously well. He was remarkable. Evil. Now, there's a remarkable leader for you, Bandon. Really? He's a jovial extrovert character, and uh, but a very shrewd judge of character, shrewd man, good leader. 
was he? Mm. Yes, one of the few aristocrats in the Air Force, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was, but he was a very good one. Excellent. Yes. Um, but and but you presumably didn't go up towards Japan or anything like that during the war. I mean, your your no. Far Eastern War was very much in Burma. Very much in Burma. When I, I started at Imphal and we finished up at, with the fall of Rangoon. Right, yes. Uh, and then the great repatriation back to Britain. Yes, well before that we we were preparing for Operation Zipper, which was going to be the invasion of Singapore. Right. Which fortunately didn't come off, because I think it would have been a bit of a... A bloodbath. Uh, I think it would have been. Then we had that awful problem of trying to deal with the rebels in... Uh, in Indonesia, which wasn't called Indonesia then. Uh, it was the Dutch East Indies, of course. That Dutch East Indies, Batavia, yes. Jakarta, those sort of names. And I stayed for that for, uh, oh, I think for a few months after the end of the war. It's very well written up. Actually based, based in Indonesia? In, well, in Singapore by then. Mm -hmm. It's well written up, that mm -hmm. phase, in a book by David Lee, uh, Chief Marshal Lee. Mm -hmm. he, he was there then. Mm -hmm. And then you came back and came, uh, went to the Staff College, which strikes me as... Slightly odd to come back to a staff college as a group captain at the time. Yes. Uh, and the Army Staff College at that. Yes, I was posted to Camberley mm -hmm. and I complained bitterly about this to... Did you? Yes, to well, ACS was very training. Much in for did you to... Uh, yeah, well, to the Army. ACS training then was uh, Sir Basil Embry, a uh, Vice Marshal Embry, who I knew quite well. And I went to see him and said I didn't want to go to Camberley, I wanted to come here. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go to the RAF staff at Auto Andover. But I was told to shut up and do what I was told, so that was that. And, uh, of course, I never regretted it. I mean, I had a marvellous time at Camberley. I, it was, I learnt a lot about the army, which I didn't know anything about, and I made a lot of friends in the army. It stood me in good stead for the rest of my life in the service. So, if you ever get a chance of going, well, you won't, but if you get a chance of going to another service, staff college, it's, it's a good thing, I think. Were we the, the only RAF man there? No, no, no there half were. A dozen more. This was the first course after the war, this must be 1947, I think, the first course after the war of nine months. Right. And there were, I should think, half a dozen airmen and perhaps a few more sailors, mm. and the rest were soldiers. And mm. it, was, it was a most instructive and enjoyable time. I, right. I, was, I never regretted it. I can imagine just after the war like that, lots of campaign analyses and so on too. To oh, yes. And of course, the poor old directing staff, your colleagues, had a terrible time because when they gave us the pink, you know, the solution, somebody would stand up and say, well, when I was... wasn't like that at all. When I was commanding the guards, armoured, my dear boy, it wasn't like that. Anyway, mm -hmm. it was a jolly good fun. I learned a great deal. Wonderful. <laughs> um, you then had, I think, some time as uh, what we would now call DDTO, I think, didn't you, the Director of yes, Training? Yes, under survival in operational um, training. But I wonder if I can just pass over that and come mm. to your time in Brussels, because he went off as air attaché there in, in 49, yes. I think. Presumably at a very interesting time, what with the, um, the well, firstly, of course, the Dunkirk Treaty, <laughs> then the Brussels Pact, and, and indeed NATO formed in, in 49. What was the feeling like in that international yes, military state, so to speak? Yes. Actually, I had two jobs then. I, I was the air attaché in the embassy, right. but also one doubled up as commanding the I think it was called the Royal Air Force delegation to the Belgian Air Force. It was, we were, the Belgian Air Force had been part of the Royal Air Force in the war, if I remember rightly, and yes. then it was starting up on its own, and we had a, a small staff to help to launch it, really. So one did that as well. Mm. Uh, and I think I was the last one to do that. And as you say, NATO was, or well, Western European Union yes, was first starting there. Yes, of course, yes. And Monty used to come up and. Mm -hmm lectures and talk a lot about Western European Union and I think we all thought it was a very good thing I'm sure uh, I imagine one must have had anxieties about getting Germany in which meant rearming Germany I, yes. I'm sure we must have been worried about that and perhaps at that age one didn't quite see the wisdom of it as one does now mm. but I think that that must have been a slight anxiety but on the whole I think one was Enthusiastic. Yes. Well, it took another six years, of course, for that to come about. Yes, but there was a lot of talk about it. Yes, it and I expect once, oh, no, I can't do that. But, but mm. there's that, kid, that was, what, 54 or something, wasn't it, when that happened? 55. 55, yeah. yes. yes. Uh, although, of course, the agreement, I think, was made in 54, wasn't mm. it? The, the Paris. That's right, that dates in my mind, 54. Yes. Mm. Yes. 
Um, and how, what was it like trying to set up something like the Belgian Air Force from presumably the ruins of war in that country? Yes, uh, I think it was fairly straightforward because uh, the Belgians, uh, I think they were firm believers, they've got to have armed forces, there's no doubt about that. Mm. I think they, their political leaders recognized that uh, the, those who'd come to fly and fight with us had a lot of experience. So it wasn't all that different. There was a lot of different... Belgium had definitely been a divided country at that time. It was divided in two ways. There were, there were those who were pro the king, Leopold, and those who had been against the king. Mm. There was, and there's the division which there is today of the, the, language. the fl language, the Flemish and the Flemish speaking and the French speaking. Mm. Uh, so, despite those divisions, uh, I think that the, the services sort of steered a steady line and got on quite well. Yes. Presumably, a lot of the equipment, the kit, must have been exported. Of course, I mean the Belgian Air Force was virtually, a, if you like, a, an RAF group. Yes. Uh, just completely RAF orientated. They all spoke English. Right. They painted Belgian roundels on the airplanes instead of ours, and they wore a different uniform. But even the uniforms were the same. And a lot of them in those days wore our wings as well as theirs. So it, it's, it was modelled entirely on Air Force lines. Yes. But you managed to get it off the ground. Yes. Very yes. Encouraging. Then, then you came back to fighter command on the, the air staff, and later you became commandant of the, uh, the central fighter establishment. Um, and as I recall from your biography, you left there in 1957, the time, of course, of the, the dreadful Sandys White Paper. Um, now, was that mere coincidence? Was it the Sands White Paper that, that cut the, the fighter establishment? Or? No, no, I don't think so. No. Uh, I did uh, two years at West Stradham, which was very interesting because of the Hunter and the Swift and the Javelin were coming in then, so right. we did a lot of work at yes. CFE on those aeroplanes, mm. the beginning of jet fighters and all that. Mm. Not the beginning, that's not right. We'd, we'd, had, we'd had meteors and vampires before, before then, but yes. the beginning of the sort of slightly next generation. Uh, and I just did two years there, and then it was my turn to go to the IDC, so I don't think it's anything to do with the, the, the Sands cuts at all. Right. Mind you, those Sands cuts must have had an enormous repercussion on morale, particularly, I imagine, in fighter command. Uh, yes, uh, but I, I, I suppose they must have done, but I don't think we ever thought, well, we're not going to get hunters or javelins into the squadrons. I don't, I don't, I don't have any no. memory of that. No. no, not really. Because the, I mean, the number of squadrons was, was axed, wasn't it? The yes, it was reduced. We did retain an embryo, and it, mm. I, you, you would know better than me, but I, don't, I wonder how long it was between the feeling that air defence was a bit on the down to the realisation that it's got to come up again. It wasn't all that long, was it? Mm. I don't know. I, I suppose some might even argue that it's really only now with tornadoes. We're really getting back yeah, again. We're really getting back mm. again. Um, but we never... Ran it right, though. No, 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 unfortunately. That unfortunately we didn't, not. No. Yes. yes, you mentioned that you, you then went on to, to IDC, which I imagine was, was quite an enjoyable year, was it? Oh, yes, it was a very enjoyable year. I just thought into my mind there when we said fighter never ran right down, and there was, as I think you said, there's time to build up on again. That's a thought I, I think is worth mentioning that we have various skills in the Air Force, I mean, air defense. Mm. Bombing, uh, photo recce, that sort of thing. It's frightfully bad if you believe that those are important skills, important uh, facets of your abilities, to let it run right down. Mm. You need that card You, you time, must keep you? a card. If you yes. let it run right down, all the expertise, Just the know how, yes. uh, and I mean right down the line, the senior NCOs, vital people. Mm. They all disperse and go elsewhere, and you, if you're going to start it up again, you've got a hell of a job. But if you just mm. keep it very small, which fighter command must have become, mm. you can expand it up again. And I think it's a very important yes. point to remember. If you say, well, we're never going to do photo recce again, or we're never going to do this or that, you'd be jolly sure you really mean that. Yes. Uh, I think it's... it's I'm sorry, I'm a digression there, but... I no, think no, I mean, it's an interesting one. The point it's applicable, of course, even today, isn't it? We, mm. you know, we're getting sea eagles onto the buccaneers now, but the buccaneers are going to run out. Run out. Yes. Because the great debate is, mm. to what extent should we stay in the yes. anti-shipping realm? Yes. So, I, it's, it's a point for the future, yeah, it's just as point. much as in the past. Yes. 
Um, IDC. Was it IDC. That's right. Was, was that oh, useful? that was very good fun. Yes, yes good. I, well, I think I was one of the last years there where you didn't have to do any work. <laughs> <laughs> that was good fun, but I didn't complete it. I was taken off the course and uh, about two thirds of the way through, I think, to go Who to. Who were you? Go you went to, out to grapple. To grapple. Yes. Now, why was that? I mean, why? Because the commander of grapple changed halfway through. Yeah. And I, I well, th found that rather extraordinary. I, I th yes. I'm not sure the word halfway through is exactly right, although it was halfway through, but the point was that my predecessor, Wilf Alton, yes. he'd got Grapple going, launched it, very yes. hard work, and yes. got, built the thing up, and got it going, and was about to do the first sort of big test, and it was foreseen that it was going to go on, and possibly, uh, you know, you wanted a... He'd done a lot of work, and you wanted to sort of ensure the continuity. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was sent out, and I went... They felt it well, would otherwise have been too long for that's right. that one. And I went and I did one with him, or he was in charge, and I was there as a makey learn, and then continued the continuity of him. Yes, oh, I see. And that was well, obviously important enough to take you away from yes. the IDC form. Yes. yes. Ah. And what about the various senior scientists in that program? Did, did you ever get to know them very well? Oh, yes, People very well indeed. I mean, the, the, I suppose, and Penny and... and yes, and, uh, Bill Penny I got to know very well. In fact, all I learnt or knew uh, about nuclear fission and what had happened and how it all worked I was uh, learnt with the chalk and blackboard from right. old Bill Penny. He's As a, his needs, so to speak. He's a wonderful instructor. He <laughs> could explain it in language that uh, a non-technical person like me could understand. And uh, I had a great admiration and indeed affection for him, and still do. He was a marvellous man. And the other chap who I was more closely connected with, actually, at, at Christmas Island, was Bill Cook, Sir William Cook, who died yes, the other day. Yes, yes. And another one was the two of them, Roy Pilgrim, Mr. Pilgrim, he's still about. Yes, one worked very closely with those people. You, you couldn't not, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, had a jolly good understanding with them. Mm. Did that actually change your attitude to civilian scientists working for the ministry or well I think or uh, an evolution in, in your view yes I'm not sure I'd formed any attitude about them right. anyway <laughs> I, I certainly came to understand these people uh, and it was extremely interesting seeing uh, particularly Christmas Island where you had the Air Force the Navy and the Army and the scientific groups mm -hmm. and uh, one of the one's major objectives was welding them all together and making them all work as a team. But the job was so important and so vital that we got it right that uh, it did work very well. Mm. And so the answer to your question is yes, I had a great admiration to these chefs. Mm. And that continued subsequently when you came back to the ministry? And yes, oh yes, certainly, yes. very much so. It's interesting, I was at a, a talk uh, just a few days ago of the RAF Historical Society and we had the, um, the, the head of the German historical branch, for want of a better term, yes. who was talking about the German Air Force in the war. And one of the characteristics seemed to be that the German Air Force never did weld in that scientific community in the same no. sort of way that we seem to have done. No. Um, uh, to their disadvantage. To their disadvantage, yes. absolutely. Well, that's the point he was making, yes. What about political pressure? At, uh, at Grapple. I mean, was there was presumably an immense political interest back in England, but did that ever permeate down to Christmas Island? Well, uh, my brief was that uh, these this series of tests, Grapple, uh, Yankee and Zulu, mm. and one or two others, uh, ha had to be completed by a certain date. Yes. And the reason they had to be by a certain date, this is related to Congress. Congress, there was a thing called the McMahon Act. Quite, yes. Remember that? And until yeah. unless we could have it on the table in Congress, proof that the British knew how to produce an H weapon and produce nuclear fission, you know, that we wouldn't have access to the know-how which the Americans had by that time acquired. Yes. And therefore there was a very strong pressure on us to do this in an almost impossible time scale. That was political pressure. Was that to get it done before Eisenhower? Uh, it was so that by, I think there was a sort of date, a Congress date line. Was that? I'm not quite remember the details, but that was it. So there's that pressure. Also, it was made very clear to me that on no account was anybody to be hurt. There was no accidents, no Japanese fishermen or anything else. So those are the two political briefs right. I had. And I had the sort of feeling that if anything had gone wrong, well, too bad, Grandy, we don't want to we'll know you. Your neck. Uh, that's yes. right. And if it goes right, thank you very much. That, 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 that was it.
Yes. Yeah, so you managed you managed to obey yeah. both of those uh, yes. those edicts. Yes, we did. Yes. Yes. Despite one or two uh, complaints, thirty years on, of course. Yes. Well, that's a, but that's that's another matter. Now you've you've obviously been a great exponent of the the concept of nuclear deterrence, and having actually actually witnessed uh, the power of the H bomb, do you feel that? Affected your views of this concept of deterrence in any sense? Did it oh, make you yeah, more convinced? convinced? Less convinced? Tremendously. I, I, I think when you've seen one of these things go off, I mean, I've often said this that at Christmas Island, just imagine that everything has been worked and concentrated towards getting this thing to go off successfully and nobody's be hurt and scientists must be satisfied that they've got all the information they want. So, once you've done all that, it's a great sense of achievement. Uh, everybody feels, my God, it's all right. The evening of that day, is, as it were, you pause and think about it, and you think of that great awe-inspiring sight in the sky, and you're, unless you're completely dumb, you're, you're convinced that this is the way to end war. I mean, you mustn't have those things going off, and so you, you're you become fervently convinced that deterrence is the right policy. Mm. And one thing I tried very hard, <laughs> very little success, to do was to persuade political people, particularly those opposed to deterrence, left-wing people, to come out and see one of these tests. And, just and I worked it. jolly hard on this, right. with no success at all. I got a lot of, lot of the chiefs of staff and all those military people came out galore. Uh, American visitors came out, but we couldn't get I remember Mr. Bevan was a very strong anti-deterrent man at that time, and I remember working jolly hard to get one or two people like him to come out and say one could talk to them and demonstrate, but they didn't want to know anything about it. But where was the block? It wasn't our own ministry or our own minister? Yeah, I, well, I, I imagine that... Uh, well, I don't know. I really don't know where the block was, but uh, I'm sure if they'd wanted to come, they would have certainly had no opposition from me. And, and uh, one was in a fairly powerful position then, because we could say, no, I don't want more yes. than so many visitors, right. and we can't cope with this and cope with that. But you would have welcomed I would. I personally numbers. would have... Uh, the, although they might have been an administratively a nuisance, I would have welcomed it. And uh, somewhere in the files, I, I made my. It was very clear, but they weren't yes. any good. Who turned what, it down? What, what a pity they didn't come. Oh it? yes, I think so. Yes. Yes. All right. Perhaps we need a few more tests and ask Mister Kinnock to come. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, perhaps one mustn't say that. Um, but of course, Miss Oppenheimer uh, and, and one or two others who were involved with the American, uh, uh, with, with Manhattan and so on. I mean, they have rather taken an opposite view, haven't they? Rather wishing that the physicists had never actually put this thing together. It's, it's not a view that, that you go along with, then. Well, I think you you can't wish that people hadn't done. I mean, you, you might say, well, is, you wish somebody had never discovered yeah, oil. I mean, it, right. it, I mean it, there's it, an inevitability, isn't there? And uh, Bill Penny always used to say to me, the thing you must realise in the scientific world Whatever you, the way the world's divided between the West and the East, I said, whatever you discover, the others will be six months ahead of you or six months behind you. Yeah. Scientific knowledge goes like that. Sometimes you get a big breakthrough, sometimes you don't, but it goes along like that. Uh, and therefore, I, I've never met Oppenheimer, but uh, I don't think what that view holds water at all. Yeah. I think it's well, I, sensitive. I certainly don't either, mm. but uh, it's interesting that some have taken that, yeah. uh, that line. Fine. Well, after Grapple, you, you came back to the UK um, and became Ancus Ops. Um, and I suppose one of your problems must have been trying to sort out some of the the repercussions from the Sands White Paper. I mean, yes, there was a lot of that, a lot of that sort of stuff going what, on. What were the worst uh, aspects there to try to resolve? I think it was I suppose I'm a bit hazy about this. I, a blue streak went out, didn't it? Yes. Uh, and I, I'm sure there was a gigantic amount of time. I can see maps now and where Blue Streak was going to be positioned all over the country and all the planning that had gone on to bring this about and everything else. So one spent a lot of time working, I think, uh, on uh, disbanding all that, that kind of thing. And there was a certain amount of um, disgruntlement uh, then at that time. One didn't like Sands. He was a very abrasive character, mm. rude man. Was he? Yes. yes. Uh, he didn't think about people or anything else, but he, he was a very, I mean, he did very well in the war on Peenemund and all that kind of thing, but he was a, a very abrasive, difficult chap, old Duncan. Mm. And presumably brought in by Macmillan to, I mean, to cut the budget, the defence budget, in, 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 
in many ways. I suppose so. so I'm just, yes. To, to that extent, I suppose he uh, fulfilled his remit. Yes. 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 But then you then you came became commander in chief in Germany. Um, perhaps in a sense, uh, uh, a rather more interesting role uh, in 1961. But again, during a period of contraction. I think we were going down from what about 18 squadrons to 12. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a significant uh, reduction. It was also very much the time of the Berlin Wall, of course, and, and not long before Cuba. And so I wonder what the political pressures were like, again, on our senior military commanders like yourself at that time. Or were you left very much to simply carry out your remit? I think one was left to carry out one's remit. Uh, there were the sort of pressures on one at that time, and very much the same as they are now. I mean, I, one was getting in, impassioned arguments about local overseas allowance, you know, the good old LOA. Yeah, all, all the and and that still goes on, doesn't right. it? Like it's always it's being it cut down and yes. it's never enough. And there are all those sort of things. Well, and as a commander-in-chief, the first time I got one's experience of all of that, the actual um, why we were there and our posture and military role was, I seem to remember, really quite a developing one. We were working hard and getting integrated with second ATAF with the Germans, the Dutch, mm -hmm. and the Belgian Air Force, our old friends there. And there was the excitement uh, generated by the wall going up and keeping touch with Berlin. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty to occupy the mind, and I, I don't think one worried too much about political. No. Was, was it actually a worrying time during the Cuba crisis, during the Berlin crisis? I mean, did, did you ever have yeah. the feeling that... There was a prospect of war, as so many others, of course. Yes, have. I think so. I, I think one thought it was a worrying time. One thought very much, thoughts coming back to my mind now. I remember being thinking a lot about the vulnerability of the clutch airfields mm. you know, at, at that time, mm. which is, a lot has been done on that since then. But in those right. days, they were all, but yes, certainly, that was in one's mind. Mm. Also, the army commander, I think, with Jim Castles, General Castles, I think he had similar worries about. Um, the ability to move his forces about. But yes, certainly. One I don't think we ever, we presumably never adjusted our alert states, did we, in Germany over that? Can't period. remember. No. We might have done a bit, man. I expect we did when we first were aware of the wall. I imagine we might have done. Mm. It doesn't stick in my mind, that. No. No. Well, it must have been a fascinating time, but then you came back to Bomber Command. Uh, in a sense, I suppose, very much during its during its heyday. I imagine there must have been a very exciting period for you. Oh yes, that was tremendous fun, and, and of course it was something completely new for me. And uh, this yes. was a, uh, a broadening of one's experience, and uh, I found it personally very interesting meeting these bomber people and getting to know them and their problems, and I did a lot of flying in the Vulcan and so on. And yes, it was a very interesting time, and of course Skybolt was mm. On the way then, and we were all fascinated about that, we had a very close liaison with SAC, Strategic Air Command. We had to go over there and see the commanders. I'm getting awfully bad at names now. I can't remember mm. the names of all the people we saw. But, but links were good, were they? Links were excellent. Really? Links were, I think, uh, forged largely in the days of uh, when Harry brought us to the CNC. Mm. Uh, they were carried on by his successor, it was Bing Cross, our Chief Marshal Cross, mm. and uh, I followed Bing uh, and kept it up and this was very important because so, you had a joint targeting policy then joint targeting you? policy and they were very close to us and uh, we uh, were in on a lot of the secrets of theirs the targeting policy and they were completely yes. in on yeah. ours it all worked very well indeed yeah. so of course you had a number of people out in the states didn't yes you? we had uh, people at uh, SAC headquarters at uh, the offered uh, yes SAC headquarters so mm. yeah, very good mm. What about Skybelt? I mean, you mentioned that again. I mean, the, the Nassau agreement, of course, was um, 62, 63, yes. right, wasn't it? Um, what effect did that have on Bomber Command? Well, I think they, they, everybody was very disappointed. We were looking forward to Skybelt, and yes. I, don't, I seem to remember in, in about 62, uh, a Skybelt was successfully launched. Yes, it, it, that's it, right. It proved that it worked. Yes. And so when we were told. Uh, that, as a result of uh, Macmillan going to Nassau and this agreement that, uh, with, which he had with Kennedy, mm -hmm. that Skybolt was a non-starter and we were going to Polaris, obviously uh, this was a shock for us. Mm -hmm. But the Air Force being what it is, I mean, it t took it in its stride 
And uh, my successor was uh, Digger Kyle, and uh, it was his job was to re fashion the force, and I think one slowly began to realize that probably it was, although we all thought Skybolt would have worked, mm. it was probably very sensible, if you're going to continue to turn us, to put it under the sea. Mm. And uh, looking back now, I think that probably... What really motivated Mike Millen, I don't know, whether he thought about putting it under the sea or whether he was thinking about money or some other deal uh, with America, I, I don't know. Well, I think President Kennedy had announced the cancellation. He it? had, yes. It would have been very difficult for Britain to, to keep going. That was, the thing. that was the point. We had to string along, so we it was inevitable. Along. Yes, that's right. Yes. What about the... No, perhaps I can ask you first. How much interest was there actually from our senior politicians in the, that conservative administration? Uh, interest in our deterrent posture, in our serviceability states, in our operational effectiveness. What was that, pretty close? Oh yes, I think so. I, I think one remembers political figures coming down and going around stations and sitting, and mm -hmm. one always welcomed them. Then mm -hmm. you may think of the damn nuisance. Well, on the other hand, if you think ahead, you, it, the more you can educate political leaders about the services and let them see you at work and meet youngsters, go around stations, the better it is. Yeah. Whatever they were, their political flavour they are, I've always believed in that very strongly. So, I think the interest was fairly good. But it's not as if you had any calls from number 10 or anything uh, saying your serviceability state's a bit too late. Oh, no, it didn't get as far as that. Quite good to that. No, not at all. What, what about the change when, um, when the Labour Party got in in, in 64? Because you were still CNC then, I think, weren't you? I was still a part of that, yes. yes. Did that have any radical effect? I don't think so. No. I'm sure if it had, I would remember it. I don't mm. think that... The Labour Party came in then with no uh, defence manifesto statement. I mean, they were, they, part of their manifesto was to continue the yes. defence policy. Yes. So it didn't have an effect, no. Yes. Well, certainly as far as the, the, the RAF's nuclear role mm. was concerned. Yeah. Um, mm, well, that's interesting. Well, then, I suppose 20 years after your last appointment in the Far East, you, you went back, this time as Commander-in-Chief of the British Forces. Far that's East. right, yes. Um, I mean, in a sense, it was, I suppose, quite an achievement, as I mentioned before, to, to, to be Commander-in-Chief in three successive appointments. Is, is that actually a unique um, occurrence? Do, do you know? You, I don't I, know. I haven't checked. I must say, perhaps I should have done. Uh, no, I, I don't know. Uh, I did know. I'm, I'm not letting you into secrets, but I mean, I, I knew before I went there that uh, I was likely to become Chief of the Air Staff, and right. therefore it would be very valuable experience for me to uh, have some time as a unified C and C. Yes. That was Army the phrase. Yes, yeah. that was the catchphrase in those days. Unified commander in chief. Yes. Do you remember unified command structures were all were the latest thing. That yes. was what was going to be. Well, of course, yes. uh, with the rundown of the forces overseas, subsequent rundown of the forces overseas, there weren't very many unified command structures left. There was one in Aden and one in the Far East, and that's all. Yes. That was the only two that ever came about. So it was a very valuable experience, mm. which I, I enjoyed immensely. There, my, that's a good example. My Camberley experience helped me there, you see. I could understand what the soldiers were talking about. Really? Do we even have some Camberley friends working? Yes, there? Oh, yes. Did you? One or two. Yes, it must have been interesting. That was good. Um, but of course, confrontation was still very much in full swing. And I think the Indonesians had actually landed some <laughs> paratroops in, in Malaya not very long before you got there. That's right. Was it actually clear at that time, do you think, to yourself and indeed your subordinate commanders that uh, that we would actually prevail in the end, that uh, it would not last very much longer? Yes, I, I think uh, 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 the brief there was to prevent war. To, to the, our objective was to convince Sukarno that, that he was on a loser, that if he, if he continued with really serious uh, military activities and attack, he wouldn't win. And we had a, a V-force capability behind the scenes yes. and we demonstrated that, that there it was and we could fly around over here. And that was the objective. And uh, it was a very, very interesting campaign because you had the three services and you had... Uh, I remember I was responsible to five prime ministers, our own, uh, Australia, New Zealand, yes. uh, Malaysia, the Tunku, and after the split, uh, Lee Kuan Yew. So, so as well. uh, there was this unified force uh, of the three services from Commonwealth countries, all poised, ready to go, some 50, 55,000 people, I think, out of mm. command. 
And it worked, uh, and it did the trick. And I guess the last time we've had a force like that overseas, yeah. so history is overseas, it was a very exciting and interesting time. Yeah, so one instance perhaps of where conventional deterrence has actually worked. Yes, uh, that, that, that is so. Yes. I've often felt that it's a great pity that there isn't uh, more known about that campaign, really. I don't know whether you study it here. I, I think it's a good thing to do. I think we probably tend not to. I'm not... Yeah. We clearly have to concentrate rather more on the Central European yeah, that's scene, right. you know, the, the current yeah. NATO. Area. And it's, it's difficult to foresee that we'll be doing anything similar in the future. To Let's hope yeah. not, yes. Yeah. Um, what about Vietnam? Because I think you were saying before that you did manage to get up to Vietnam. Yes, the Americans were very uh, kind. I went up there to Saigon. Uh, mm. Certainly twice, I'm sure. And it was they who invited you, was it? Rather yes, than, I think so. Yeah. I uh, worked fairly closely with uh, CNC Pacific, who had his headquarters in Hawaii, Admiral Sharp. Right. I'd got to know him well, and he, uh, I think, agreed that I could go up to Saigon, and London agreed. London agreed rather grudgingly, because uh, there was pressure on the government at that time to put... British forces into Vietnam. Yes, one battalion of the Black Watch, wasn't yeah, that the, that's, the phrase? That's right. Yes. And I suspect, looking back, I was, would have probably supported that view. Really? Uh, but on the feeling you we're all in together, you know, there's this war going on, with the Americans are running, we ought to be with them. I think, with hindsight, I'm very glad we weren't, because it was a, not a very successful war. But I do remember General Westmoreland telling me all about the bombing, and I remember coming back feeling depressed, because I think it, I was convinced that they were misusing the great B-52 bomber strikes, you know, bombing the jungle, and it doesn't work. No. And, uh, Fine in linebacker against Hanoi, but uh, yeah, such a, I, that was a little I, I think the, their attitude, the whole American attitude, well, they became disillusioned with the war, I think. Yes. Uh, and people at home began, feeling, uh, the casualties were very high, and people at home mm -hmm couldn't see any purpose, couldn't see any reason. And the Vietnamese people themselves, all they wanted was a quiet life. They didn't give a damn whether the, the leaders were communists, Americans, or who they were. They wanted peace. Don't forget, they, Vietnam had been at war since, since the, the French. Yes. 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 Dien Bien Phu and all that kind of thing. So, that, right. so it was a, a war which uh, there was real, real purpose to. So I'm very glad now that we weren't involved in it. Yes. Did you come back with any hard and fast lessons, do you think, that you could actually apply in uh, in Malaysia? Well, I think the lesson one learnt, uh, although it, what it didn't really need learning, was that the campaign which Field Marshal Templer had waged against communists in Malaysia mm -hmm. took a long time, mm -hmm. but one was reinforced in one's view that the, that the reason that was successful was because he was able to show to the Malaysian people that if you work with me, I'm going to offer you a better life. We'll defeat the communists. Mm -hmm. And so he was slowly be able to work up through Malaysia uh, and convince people that uh, he, they were on a winner supporting him, whereas the Americans hadn't, weren't able to do that. Mm -hmm. And I, so one was reinforced in one's mind that that was... Mind. The confrontation was quite different to that. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I suppose what I was also thinking of in uh, trying to compare and contrast Vietnam with what you were doing was the immense importance of helicopter operations, which, I mean, obviously the Americans uh, found that in Vietnam, but I suppose we had, even up at that stage, discovered that um, both yes. in Malaya in the 50s, but, but during confrontation too. Oh, in Borneo, yes, in yes. In Borneo in particular. Uh, couldn't, couldn't have uh, done that job without mm. helicopters. Very important. And you had an enormous number of Royal Navy helicopters too, I think. We did, to start probably with. Probably rather more than we provided at one stage. Uh, yes, to start with, I think that was... Yes. Uh, mm. But that didn't really worry me. I, I think I wore a unified hat there, and that didn't really worry me very much. I mean, uh, where they came from. Where they came from, as long as they operated. That, that was the main thing. Yes, and it, it obviously worked. Yes, certainly. Yeah. Well, the confrontation ran out of steam in... Uh, in August 86, I think, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, 66. Yeah. actually called it off. Um, at about the same sort of time, I guess, as the 66 Defence Review heralded the withdrawal of all our forces from uh, from Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. um, now, what 
to what degree were you actually involved in that decision? Very, very much? No, not, not at all. Not at all. I mean, it was no, all done from London. It was all done from London. Uh, I had nothing to do with it whatsoever. My successor had, had to deal with the withdrawal. I mm. came back at, at uh, I suppose, the end of 66. Mm. Uh, so I had nothing to do with that decision. Yes. Well, I mean, was that not strange in any way, that the man on the spot was not consulted? Well, I, I think... Uh, one was involved in up to August 66 w with confrontation. Then there must have been a, a period where one wondered whether it really, Sicano had seen the light yeah, and so on and yeah. so forth. And I suspect then uh, Mr. Healy must have come out, and I remember his visiting us several times, and he must have told us the new policy. And I'm sure one must have said, I think this is madness. But uh, Policies made up in London, not really here. I expect I must have sent impassioned telegrams back saying how important it was that we <laughs> maintain our forces out there. But uh, so you didn't approve of the decision at all? No, no, you don't on the spot. It's not, you, you know, you're told because well, this was the whole the idea. I mean, the, we've been in Singapore since before I joined the Air Force, so the idea of pulling out... Gosh, it must have been over 100 yes, years. You thought, this is madness, and I'm yes. sure one must have said so in impassioned telegrams, and yes. staying up late at night telling Mr. Healy he's, he's out of his mind, but that doesn't make any difference. Policy so is made in uh, London. Yes, quite. Which I suppose is where it should be. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you came back to London then, yes. as, uh, as Chief of the Air Staff uh, in 67. But very much at a time, of course, when the Royal Air Force was to lose this, this great deterrent role of ours. Um, and I just wonder whether you felt at that time, coming back from overseas, whether you felt that in any sense the Air Force's existence was again under threat. I mean, losing this enormously important role, which really been its raison d'etre for, for many, many years. Did you feel that, uh, that that was the case, that this was, could be a mortal blow? Uh, not. Could not, could not could be a mortal blow, your phrase, not at all. One sensed uh, a lot of loose talk about that, well, you know, there it is. Uh, why have an Air Force? But that's very easy to answer, because the air is a profession as the sea or the land is, and we were the professionals at the air, and therefore, although we might be reduced in size, I think as long as you needed aeroplanes to support land and at sea activities, then you you needed an air force, and I, so I, I don't think one felt one had to argue and persuade and convince people uh, of that thesis. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think one ever felt there was any danger of a mortal blow. No. Good. But did you ever have? Did you feel that you had to plan rather carefully uh, a shift in emphasis then for, from for the Royal Air Force? Uh, towards this rather more tactical air force that we have today. Yes, probably. That probably one did, yes. I, I think that, that might have been so. I think so. Mm. Particularly, of course, um, with the F-111 cancellation and indeed the reduction yes. with our transport force that, that happened right. around that time. Uh, one was very uh, disturbed about the TSR-2 mm. and then the F-111. Mm. And uh, I should say... A great deal of my time as CAS was working on the, what we call the MRCA then, mm. multi rail combat aircraft, uh, which became the tornado. And getting that through and getting agreement was uh, occupied a great deal of one's time. I remember there were quite a lot of nations to start with. It was going to be uh, supported by Canada, Holland, the Belgians the Dutch, the Italians, and the British. Yes. Uh, and they slowly they just fell off. Fell they? by the wayside, and it sure. finished with uh, the Italians, the Germans, and ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, the chiefs of staff, the chiefs of air staff of those countries, we were, we were all very good friends. And uh, But the others, the ones who fell by the wayside, were defeated by their political leaders. Uh, and uh, so it was very gratifying in the end mm -hmm. when uh, Mr. He was convinced it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Presumably personalities did play quite a part in that. I mean, you, you say that your mm. German and Italian CASs were, were great friends of yours. Yes, Steinhoff was the German, a splendid man, and mm. uh, Finale uh, was the Italian. He uh, died the other day. Yes, we, we worked very closely together indeed. Mm. Must give you immense satisfaction now to see uh, our, virtually all of our 365 tornadoes uh, yeah, <laughs> going into service. Yeah, certainly. Wonderful. Um, now, you also presided over that quite fundamental change in the 
composition of our officer corps, didn't you? The um, demise, yes. the abandonment of Trenchard's old flight cadet scheme that had been yes. going for, what, 50 years? Um, did you see that as inevitable, and to, to what extent did you regret that move? Uh, the AMP in those days was, uh, I think, nearly all of my time. I had uh, two AMPs, uh, one was Bob Hodges, uh, before him was Andrew Humphrey. Mm -hmm. And this, Andrew was very enthusiastic about this. Was he? And he uh, convinced me of the importance of it. And I think he was right at the time, as I mentioned to you earlier on this morning, uh, up to then, with Cranwell, uh, the I, one's sights were set on the sixth form boy at public schools. Mm -hmm. He was the chap who you wanted to get. You, so you wanted to get the best out of the sixth form to come to Cranwell, and you got your brains. That was your, the best source of brains, young brains, for the service. Well, then it became quite obvious that those best brains were in the 60s going on up to university. Many more people going to university, or put it the other way around, universities became a possibility for a much wider cross-section of yes. uh, school leavers than had been the case in the past. So those brains were not sixth form, they were all going on to universities, therefore we had to put our sights on the universities. And this is, uh, I think, realized very much by Andrew, and he certainly convinced me it was the right thing for us to do. And I think we all thought that that was right at the time, and I think it was right. And you'll know here, didn't the other two services follow suit eventually in evolving university schemes and so on and so forth? I think they've all taken a great portion of their people yes. that way. So I, I, yet, I think this is right. Mm. And parallel with that, you had to retain all that Cranwell stood for, and this is quite difficult to do. Mm. But I think we've achieved that now. And Cranwell still means what it always has been, I think. Mm. Yes, I suppose there are some who still wonder whether we could perhaps now still attract some of the success. Yes, Sir Dermot Boyle is a great protagonist of that. I don't know whether when he was sitting in the studio, he may have, it's one of his hobby horses, he probably yes. may have, and I think he genuinely feels he may be right. I think he thinks that perhaps things are not right. On the other hand, we're still, I think, attracting uh, yes. sufficient talent. Well, you only need go to a station today or go to Cranwell itself and uh, you see some splendid young men, and that, that yes. convinces me. Long may it continue. Mm. What about the, the new command structure for the Royal Air Force? Because, again, that came in very much during your time, did it not? Oh, the fighter shift from fighter yeah. and bomber mm. and, uh, and air support command. Strike command. Mm. Uh, I think that was inevitable. I mean, you uh, you weep tears of emotion. Good gracious, bomber command, you know, yes. fighter command, coastal command, transport. You, but you mustn't be emotional about that sort of thing. I mean, this is inevitable and it's sad and everything else. But I think you've got to you've got to cut your coat according to the cloth. I mean, you, you couldn't go on having those things. And I think that's right. I think we've we've got it about right now. Mm. Well, was it a difficult uh, shift to make? I mean, was there much yeah, opposition? Expect, yes, I expect so. You get yeah. die-hard opposition. Yes. But uh, if you're convinced yourself that it's right, then you've got to get on with it. And I'm sure those were the right decisions. Uh, and yes. uh, I'm sure, you're looking back, I'm sure you think the same. Maybe. Oh, yes. I mean, I think the structure we've got now is... Yes. So, so, so it seems to me very sensible. See, modern communications make such a difference now. I mean, uh, the communications have vastly revolutionized life, haven't they, in every way? Yes. Yes. So I think it's dead right. Yes. Well, I'm sure over the next, these next 10 years, the Air Force yes. is going to get even better yes. on the control systems. But can I now turn to your views of the men at the top, and perhaps your colleagues on the Chiefs of Staff Committee? Um, what were relations like between yourself and the other chiefs? I and mean, it wasn't all that long, was it, after the, um, uh, the amalgamation into the Ministry of Defence? I mean, was that working well? Was there really a good... Yes, well, I, well, that's right. I succeeded, uh, I succeeded Sam Elway as Chief of the Air Staff, and during yes. his time there'd been a, that great battle with the Navy over yes. aircraft carriers yes. and all that. Yes. Uh, and his... Uh, uh, he then became CDS. And so relations between the Navy and the Air Force were a little... Strange. Strained, I think is a good word. Mm -hmm. Now, the Naval Chief then was Admiral Begg, Admiral Begg, who, had, who I'd followed in the Far East, as he was the unified CNC. He was mm -hmm. the second unified CNC out there. Yes. Dick Howell was the first, then Begg, and then me, or the other way around, I can't quite remember. Well, Begg and I were determined, I knew him quite well, the, the relations between the two says has got to get on, and we'd got to get on properly. 
this army, the CIGS then was Jim Castles, General Castles, who I had known very well in Germany. So we three knew each other very well, that was, and we were determined that the services, the three, would get on. And I think that determination from us sort of spread down mm -hmm. the line to the stars. And so, uh, on the whole, I would say relationships were good. Mm. And what about with our political masters, or your political masters at the time? Well, I had three years with uh, Mr. Wilson's government, that is three years with Dennis Healy, mm -hmm. and a year with Ted Heath, with, uh, with Lord uh, Carrington. Uh, Peter Carrington, Lord Carrington, yeah. Healy was a, is a, an extremely difficult man to describe. He, he's a, <laughs> he can be all sorts of different people. He, he's, you've got to remember that he was the defence secretary of a Labour government which didn't like defence. Defence was a bore. Chiefs of staff, we'd rather not know. You, you, defence was a, uh, we've got to have defence, yes, but to give it the minimum. And he fought against that, and he fought a good battle for us. There's no doubt about it. The umpteen defence reviews went on and so on, but and he, he did strive and work jolly hard for us. He's a great intellectual. He goes into things in enormous detail. Uh, and so uh, he did well for the services. He's a very difficult man to work with, but uh, if one stood up to him, uh, we, you had to get down. I mean, he's the Secretary of State, so it's up to you to get on with him uh, and fight your corner hard, and you were, I think, respected for that. Yes. And would you see him, would, would you judge him as a, as a great Secretary of State? or Because he was there a long time, wasn't he? Yes, yeah, he was uh, he, that's right, he was three years, wasn't he? Mm. Uh, three or, but about that, more than that. I would say what I've just said. I, I wouldn't necessarily say a great Secretary of State, but I would say, bearing in mind the government, his government, he did a good job. Mm, excellent. And what about Lord Carrington, you say? Different kind of man altogether, because he, uh, he, he believed in defence, uh, and the government he was with, uh, Mind you, Healy believed in defence too, don't I? Mustn't, uh, make, I must make that quite clear. Healy believed in defence, it was his colleagues that he had to deal with. Yes. But Carrington had an easier job in that his colleagues believed in defence. Yes. as well as himself. Yes. Mind you, of course, he did try to, or the Conservative government of Ted Heath did try to turn the clock back a little, didn't they? Particularly yes. with regard to the Far East. Yes, um, they did a bit. But the again, to me see, of... all these things, all governments are de depend on money availability and the yes. pressures and pressures. Yes. Yes. He had an equally difficult job, really, as all that. Fascinating. Well, Sir John, you know, with an illustrious career like that, I'm sure you don't regret any moment of it. Um, and I know it's a slightly invidious question, we discussed it briefly before, but I, are you able to give us some indication of what you think your greatest contribution was, what, what you were actually what made most proud of during your, during your career? Well, I think I'm proud of the fact that it, my, I was persuaded my father to let me join the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> really, and it's a very difficult question to answer there. Yes, uh, quite. I'm sure. I mean, I, I've been extraordinarily lucky. A lot of my colleagues didn't survive the war. I was lucky enough to survive it. I've had some wonderful experiences. Again, it's a very good fortune. I think, uh, I'm sort of talking out of my head now, but I, I think perhaps um, being fortunate enough to form and command uh, a squadron in the Battle of Britain was a, 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 a great experience and a, and a marvelous thing to, uh, to have done. I was close enough to get shot down very soon after we'd started, but that it's a thing I'm not proud of, but there we are. Grapple was a wonderful experience because one was on one's own, as we have mentioned yes. earlier this morning, yes. and you were there, it had to go right, and you had some quite big decisions to make. You, you couldn't refer up the line, you, you were there, so that was a, I'm, I'm very proud of that, went all right. And of course, perhaps one's greatest pride is to having to be thought good enough to be made chief as is the air staff and to be head of your own services must make you proud, must make yes, a great accolade. Mm. Well, Sir John, thank you so much indeed. I've, I've certainly found it a fascinating hour and all I can hope is that you've enjoyed it as much as oh, I have. I enjoyed it immensely, yes. Really again, fun. may I say how very grateful we are that you've spared the time to come to Bracknell no, this morning. Delighted.